Yes, I'm joined by four MEPs, Conservative Timothy Kirkhope, visitor from the Yorkshire region, uh, UKIP's William Dartmouth, Labour's Claire Moody and the Green Party's Molly Scott Cato. First, polls asking people which big issues influence the way they vote traditionally show Europe a long way down the list. Is that, though, finally changing? William, UKIP obviously sees Europe as the, the big issue, and principally leaving it. Has your hour come? Is this why you're having these electoral successes? The well, uh, at the last general election, we got, we got about 3.66% 3 of the vote. Now the polls have, have us at 15%. We think that that's a bit understated. And there are some reasons for that, which is that, first of all, the, the, the big UKIP issue has always been sovereignty. And one of the aspects of sovereignty, or our lack of it, has been that we basically have, so long as we're in the European Union, we have open borders. And the but consequence could... of that is that 450 million people have the absolute right to live, work and settle in the United Kingdom. In consequence of that, immigration has become, which is deeply tied up with our membership of the European Union, cannot be separated from it, inextricably a part of it, has become a major issue. Some polls have it as the major issue. And, of course, it's absolutely notable that both... Mr Miliband, the leader of the Labour Party, and David Cameron, Cameron, the Prime Minister, are all interested in not talking about this, in not talking about it at all. And as I said last time I was on your programme, anyone who does talk about it gets abused. Now, we do have two representatives of, of both Labour and the Conservatives and the Greens, and I would, and I would really say, on behalf of the British electorate, I would ask that this abuse stops so that we can have a serious discussion. <laughs> Timothy, I mean, yes. David Cameron spent the run-up to the last election desperately trying to avoid talking about Europe or banging on about Europe, as he called it. Mm. Now, of course, he's desperately keen to go around talking about his referendum. Cynically, possibly something to do with the rise of William's party? It's an absolute joy to come on a programme and hear a bit of a manifesto of the UKIP, because we never know what they're coming up with next. It's an interesting sort of uh, uh, declaration or two by, by William here. Uh, um, as far as I'm concerned, actually, I think that the position taken by David Cameron and the government on the issue of Europe and indeed on issues to do with immigration um, are precisely what the people uh, in Cornwall, but also people in the country as a whole, want to but hear. It's because you're frightened by Williams Park, isn't it, really? No, I think we are. No, I think, I think the issue is, I used to be an immigration minister in the UK. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's always been a matter which people want to talk about. <laughs> Molly, I mean, you... Uh, became an MEP at the last European election. Is that because people are suddenly more engaged in Europe? Are they voting for you as a Green for quite different reasons, disillusionment with the traditional parties generally? Well, people told me after the election that the reason they voted for me and the reason we did well and actually have an MEP now is that we had a very positive message about Europe and the other parties were, were negative and they didn't respond well to that. So we're happy to be pro-European, but we do think there's a need for change, particularly in terms of waste and corruption. On this issue of Europe, I mean, if we go back to the Tony Blair years, Labour was very publicly and vocally pro-European. You get the sense, don't you, that like the Conservatives possibly, you're being slightly driven and cowed by UKIP's success. We don't hear this sort of open pro-Europeanism anymore. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that, actually. I, I think, uh, obviously, you know, I have conversations with uh, our front bench back home, etc. And we are absolutely pro-Europe. And that is our concern, if you like, about... Uh, the position that's been taken by the Conservative Party regarding the, what, the referendum that's proposed after the election. Yeah. Firstly, if there was a transfer of greater powers, we would have a referendum. But the second point I'm making is that it's whose reforms do you want? Because your reforms are ones that take away the kind of fairness no, arguments no, no. around the market okay, and reduce not. it to pure I've got, I've, I've, I've got to just say, in, in, in half a phrase, David Cameron is giving us another cast-iron guarantee. Is that what's is that what it's going to be called, Tim? Well, I don't know. I don't think you could give it, giving guarantee. us another policy, I'm not sure. OK, okay this is, we're opening up a massive debate now, and we <laughs> need to come a little bit closer to home. Beautiful and fashionable it may be, but Cornwall's economic performance still languishes below three quarters of the EU average. The good news is that it has qualified for another £450 million of European funding between 2014 and 2020 to continue growing its economy. But a year after the programme officially began, we're still waiting amid fears that Cornwall is losing millions in potential growth. Tamsin Melville reports. From smaller success stories like this to the big flagship projects of Newquay Airport, the Eden Project and Superfast Broadband, the stamp of EU aid is a familiar sight across Cornwall. 
but with the county still unable to go it alone, are the handouts really working? Behind this picture postcard corner is a place that after more than 15 years and nearly a billion pounds of cash from Brussels remains one of the poorest regions in the EU, ranked alongside the likes of Bulgaria and Estonia. Visiting this EU-funded project in Redruth last month, the Prime Minister was asked about the next chunk of cash coming Cornwall's way. Being able to make decisions locally on how to spend the £500 million is seen as crucial to shaking off the poor man of England tag. Ministers are insisting there will be specific flexibilities, but the body responsible for driving economic growth says it's not looking good. The latest funding round should have been well underway by now. Ministers blame European Commission bureaucracy, but the delay has left business leaders anxious about lost millions to the economy. The Commission says Cornwall is part of an England-wide programme and that it's working to conclude discussions with authorities as soon as possible. In the world of EU funding, it's clearly not always plain sailing. Claire, we asked the Commission to explain the delay. They perhaps diplomatically um, declined to do so. You're maintaining that basically this government's messing it up and when you were organising these funding programmes on the British side, everything was much smoother. Absolutely. And uh, I think this really genuinely is an issue of competence in the UK government. It's difficult, isn't it, to simply say, well, this is European bureaucracy that's getting this bogged down. Is, is this happening on your watch? No, there have been changes in the nature of how grants are actually uh, dispensed. Um, and I think the government's main priority has been to try and see how much we can get more local input into that. I mean, the good news is, and I think it should be a good news story, not a, a sort of miserable, downbeat one by Labour as usual. This but, delay is bad news, isn't it? Well, Nobody it, can argue well, that. Well, OK, good. but if you take a look at the original grants, uh, previous grants, Objective 1 grants, uh, ERDF money and so on, it all does actually take time in terms of the procedures and processes. What is good news is that very large sum of money, uh, a record amount of money uh, in the South West, which actually is going to be extremely useful and everybody knows that and that is something which the government has worked very hard to achieve. Okay, well we've had a lot from the two traditional parties. William, uh, I seem to remember both you and Nigel Farage have uh, said, well actually this, uh, this funding isn't very significant anyway, so presumably well, it's not something you're terribly no, worried about. We've actually never said that. We've never well, said no, that. I, I, Nigel certainly had a bit of funding, he me. told me. You've never heard that from me. Views. You've never heard that from me. It's highly significant, but I'd make the point that it's, it's simply our money, which some of which we're getting back. For each one pound Cornwall gets back, Cornwall will have paid out about one pound sixty-five. Now the fact of the matter, and also the money which your film didn't say and should have done, the money it gets, from, gets from in these EU programmes is very heavily circumscribed. It first of all has to go through the EU bu bureaucracy with the consequences which we've just been hearing and also the specific projects have to be EU approved. But there's a much more profound point here and I must just correct um, the, the Labour MEP. Scotland doesn't receive any money under this particular programme, although Wales does. All three of and these parties, the including and amazingly the Greens, are all in favour of more countries joining, more very poor countries joining the EU. Albania, Serbia. But despite that, Cornwall Serbia, still qualify. Albania, Serbia. Yeah. Rather worrying, perhaps, anyway. I can, perhaps I can finish yeah. my yeah. sentence, actually, okay. uh, Martin. Albania, Ser Serbia, and Turkey. The consequence of this is more poor, poor, poor countries come in and Cornwall ultimately cease to be eligible for this funding. When the last round of countries came in in 2002, Merseyside and South Yorkshire, which was eligible for this funding, became ineligible because there were other very, very, very poor countries oh. in. And Estonia was even oh. mentioned in your Can film. Just... Now, whenever I raise this, it's always ignored by these people, and perhaps it's time that they really answer okay. the question. Uh, very if quick... you want Cornwall to get money, why are you in favour of Turkey becoming a member okay, of the question, European Union? The question is, of course, Cornwall is eligible, and I think there is a point here. As economic growth continues, as the development of the British economy... Let again, growth, you're ignoring this then, question. Then, then of course, of course ideally, ideally, the levels at which grants are paid and so on. Obviously, we would hope that all, all parts of the UK uh, would end up not having to draw monies. But these monies are, as, and William's correct on that, they are our monies to draw, they're correct, it's proper, and the European Union, actually, is providing that money. You're talking about a specific amount of money that goes to Cornwall and goes to South Wales, uh, but it is all... On a specific programme, it doesn't go to Scotland. It's all the funding 
that comes through European M Union money, funding. Just very quickly, oh, just very quickly. It's still our money. I it's still our money. Very quickly, if William will let me, that people would have to trust his party to give the same amount of money to Cornwall, and I think people in Cornwall will be foolish to do that, right. and they're much safer with the European Union. Well, I don't know where that came from. Okay, but we will have a general election very soon to see how many people trust William's party. Particularly don't trust the Labour Party. And the rest of your party. Start now. 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 Start this week as MEPs tackled legislation for processed foods. The focus is on items such as sausages and pies, and where the labels must say where the meat inside comes from, not just where it was made. And there are fresh calls for a cut in VAT on tourism, as businesses in the southwest demand to be put on a level playing field with the rest of Europe. 25 of the 28 member states have a lower rate. As the pound is strengthened against the euro, our foreign visitors, particularly German and French, uh, have fallen quite dramatically. It just shows that market is quite price sensitive. And um, when you look at the VAT rates they're paying in their hotels, it's little little wonder that they think, think UK hotels are quite expensive in comparison. Meanwhile, hospitals in Devon and Cornwall are looking to Europe to fill the nursing shortfall in the region's hospitals. The Royal College of Nursing says it's their worst shortage yet, with about 800 vacancies. That's nearly 6% of total posts. Molly, I, farmers in the South West have been waiting, I don't know, as long as I can remember, I think, for clearer labelling in terms of processed meat products. You're presumably in favour of this vote. I think it was great news that we voted for this labelling. It was actually originally a green initiative, although we've worked very closely with the Socialists and Democrats here to get it through. It will enable people to feel confident about the meat that they're eating. William, I suspect you might well say a good thing, but we could just do this domestically. Yes, a, a good thing, better done at the national level. And by the way, if I may just presume to correct my colleagues, what was passed yesterday was actually a resolution. It's got no legislative force. Absolutely, but it's, it's moved no it on, 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 on better, the route to possibly better done, becoming... Better, better done at the national level. And incidentally, it just shows just how much power we've ceded away to the European Union, which is different from Europe, by the way, um, that something as, de something as detailed, although important, as, as, as food, food labelling seems to come under the European Union and not, under, and not at the national level. It would happen much, much better. People want to know it's British food as well, and other parts of Europe, but surely. It could be done in the UK. We have a very big we market. We have a UK parliament. Thank you very much. William, we, we touched on really the, the single market. I mean, does that, that have some attraction for you, surely, doesn't it? I mean, there are obviously Eurosceptics who would say, I want to strip away all of this sort of accretion I, well, around I, I'm the in, European I'm project. in the process of writing a book about it, actually. Uh, Can't wait. It's taking me a very long time. <laughs> you'll, you'll get not the first copy. We'll I get, get the second copy. Martin, Martin, Martin will get the remainder. Martin will get the first copy. William, uh, the, 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 the single, um, according to Pascal Lamy, the the single market covers about 80% of manufactured goods and only about 40% of services. And of course, the, the major major um, driver of, 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 of a, a very important segment of British exports is services, which is basically excluded or something. There are also great chunks of human of, of activity uh, which actually aren't in the single market at all. What the single market has been used for in the last 20 years is, is as a driver for more and more and more European integration without delivering very much in terms of market at yes. all. Can we all and, that, and that is why you all record. sit there. You've all been sitting there. <laughs> Thank you very much. With, There's a very good with, sales with respect, pitch you're putting up With here. respect. You've been sitting <laughs> there for 20 years. There's still a single market committee. I have, I have, Where is the single market? He feels a bit it's like listening to you, yet. William. OK, we we're now, right, we are going to now let William go away, write his book. We'll look forward to its <laughs> publication. Exciting. Thank you to you all.